we had our uh, first committee meeting of Materials Australia uh, when the lockdown uh, happened about four months ago, and we said what we should what should we do uh, in these strange circumstances, and what would both be beneficial and of interest to our, meet, our members. And so we thought, well, there's lots of people that are doing the, the hard lifting who have pivoted their, their manufacturing or, or their maker spaces to contribute um, to our communities and to help solve the PPE shortage. So it would be very good um, to recognize those people, but also to learn uh, what manufacturing and materials challenges uh, they experienced. And so we decided our first virtual event would be around a pivoting and we have three excellent uh, groups of speakers. Uh, one group from a university, one group from a SME and another group from a, a startup. So we will be delighted to hear from each of you today. And then we will have a short question and answer session. And we hope that we'll understand better and have potentially be able to uh, think and plan uh, for the future from what you tell us today. Now I'm just checking my list to see whether Victoria Wells has joined us and I don't think she has joined us yet. I hope she's not having um, connectivity problems. I will drop her an email very shortly. So I will ask then, we will change the order and um, go directly to uh, ANU and ask if uh, Sophia Cole and Rachel Hanwick can present to us first. Sophia is the coordinator in your makerspace engineering and Rachel is the Ground Control and Technical Officer for the Makerspace Physics. So uh, if you could both um, present to us and once again, uh, if all others could uh, mute um, your, uh, your mics, that would be good. And after Sophia, Neil will probably go directly to you if Victoria uh, has not yet turned up. So. Over to you, Sophia and Rachel. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having us today. So I'm going to start and then my colleague Rachel will take over and then we'll close uh, again with um, some of our observations, which I'll be talking about at the end. Um, regarding muting, just before we get started, those of you who are not muted, uh, you can mute in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. There's a little microphone button that says mute. Um, all right, I'm going to get started. So we represent the Makerspace at ANU. A Makerspace is a slightly different fabrication site to the ones that you might be thinking of because it's primarily community-based, open source, and open access. Um, and so I'll start with just explaining what a Makerspace is and then the beginning of how we pivoted. So a makerspace is a fundamentally open access, open source workshop built to support the resurgence in the maker movement worldwide. In the ANU makerspace, our unofficial motto is doing is a different way of thinking. Founded by the Research School of Physics in 2016, we now have staff across both physics and engineering, and we also work closely with not only both schools, but also the School of Art and Design. So we do have someone who needs to mute. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, I'll just jump in. So Ivan, you can actually go to the list of participants and mute individually if you need to, if people aren't sure whether they're muted or not. Yeah, because we do need to mute uh, Mona Alizade. Um, And in the meantime, I'll keep going. So we do work closely with uh, engineering physics and the School of Art and Design, which reflects another one of our axioms. Interdisciplinary environments are the non-negotiable basis of genuine innovation. And this will come up again in the presentation. We also believe that play and experimentation is fundamental to knowledge creation. 
And it's for this reason that we do not distinguish between academic and hobbyist making. It's important to stress that without an emphasis on open access, open source and open exchange, you do not have a maker space. You have a traditional lab with a 3D printer in it. It was this philosophical distinction that allowed us to pivot so quickly and easily. So on the week beginning with the 24th of March, the ANU responded to the rapidly evolving situation with COVID-19 by announcing the closure of the campus. At the same time, we begun to be approached by users and healthcare workers in our network, asking if we were able to make PPE. Since the 30th of March, we have made 2,808 utility masks and 6,613 face shields. In order to provide a succinct case study, we'll be focusing primarily on the face shields today. Our size and interdisciplinary philosophy gave us the agility that enabled the quick pivot. Our speedy response was also reinforced by our commitment to remain non-commercial and to distribute a non-commercial product. So we were distributing free products, no money changed hands. Um, and this is something that we had the virtue of doing because we were supported by the university. Uh, in a similar vein, we were also able to act so quickly due to the open source philosophy of makerspaces worldwide, who openly distributed designs and manufacturing methods beginning right at the beginning of the pandemic. So as Sophia mentioned, uh, the last week of March was really a period of immense uncertainty. So the university shifted to a remote working and learning model. Uh, COVID-19 seemed to be sticking, picking up steam in Australia and there was a real bubbling sense of panic. Um, so as a makerspace, we were seeing what other maker communities were doing around the world in places that were hit much harder and faster than us. Uh, they were rapidly shifting to fabricating shields and masks, gowns, even ventilator parts. Uh, but before jumping in, we really felt a big responsibility to make sure we could fill an identified need and not just place a further burden on stretched healthcare workers by providing unwanted goods. One of our biggest strengths is our community um, and a network, our network of current and former members. So we reached out to a uh, former member or user of the space who went through postgraduate medicine here, who now worked at ACT Health. Uh, he got back to us really quickly. Um, and we discovered that there was a strange sort of circumstance where the most, the, the product that was most in shortage, face shields, um, was actually something that was the easiest thing for us to fabricate and to get out to them very quickly. So once we had confirmed that need, uh, we jumped into action. The very next day, we had rough prototypes that were picked up for trial by uh, clinicians in Canberra's hospital network. Uh, which were quickly and very cheaply fabricated using laminating pouches, uh, weather strip foam and elastic staple onto them. Uh, we pretty quickly discarded 3D printing as a viable option for sort of small to medium scale manufacturing. Uh, we based them on an open source design from that was developed at a makerspace at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, and it's a very simple construction that we tweaked uh, based on feedback from the clinicians. So this was all happening very rapidly. Um, we hadn't even kicked off the project yet. Uh, and it was really a matter of days from when we were wondering what we could do to help to actually having proven prototypes that we could uh, kick the project off with. Things didn't really slow down from there. Uh, so on the 30th of March, we had our kickoff meeting and we really confirmed our scope. So as a relatively small scale fabricator, we really only plan to make PPE as a stopgap. Uh, measure. So really to fill the need, the immediate need for face shields in that interim period between that very current shortfall and then when local manufacturers could jump on board later. We knew the speed at which we could pivot meant that we could make a difference very quickly, um, but we also knew our limits in terms of larger scale production. So our initial target was just 2,000 shields uh, to be donated to local health services. Um, it quickly became clear that communication was the biggest thing with our team. We were grappling uh, with new working from home arrangements. Um, so we had just set up a specific project digital workspace to work in to simplify communications within our team and also to the wider, our wider organization. Um, we then allocated project roles so we could move quickly on iterating and prototyping while simultaneously uh, sourcing 
materials um, to start larger scale production. Um, so as part of the team were prototyping and fabricating assembly jigs, we were simultaneously exploring our bulk material options. Um, we don't usually buy large quantities of foam or film or elastic, um, so we really uh, had to build up our supply chain from scratch. Um, we audited the initial quantities for the 2000 we had planned. We bought elastic from a bulk haberdashery supplier um, and got a roll of DT film that we could laser cut. Foam ended up being the longest lead time. We were after adhesive backed uh, foam that was suitable for prolonged skin contact, um, cut to size, uh, ideally to minimize the work we had to do assembly. We found a foam converter in Victoria who from the initial cold call to actually getting the materials on site turned it around in like a week and a half, so well under two weeks. Um, that also expanded our project scope. The minimum order quantity for the foam was 17,000. Um, so from that initial 2,000 plan, we jumped up to 17,000. Luckily, we had a very proactive and motivated school director uh, who enabled our purchases. Um, so after we locked in the foam, the film actually became the most difficult material to lock down. We started with the PET, which was laser cutterable. Um, but when you laser cut it, we found we were getting smoke, smoke residue on it and we had to wipe them down, which increased the assembly time. Uh, and then the stock became problematic. Trying to get that from the supplier again, it became a six week lead time because um, everyone was after film to make shields at that point. So then we shifted to a PVC film um, that we could get through a local supplier who had a national uh, su supply chain. Um, that came in stacks. Uh, we couldn't cut that in the laser because it was PVC, but uh, it was very easily CNC'd. We did actually clear out the stocks of our local supplier for that um, when we placed our bulk order, because it's not something they usually have a lot of stock on hand for, um, but they were very accommodating and we could have got more within a couple of weeks if, if we had needed it. Um, and it actually became the superior option for fabrication. So because we are a network and a community, we could draw on um, the knowledge and skills of our broader community across campus. So that included a drawing on the knowledge and fabrication skills of artists, craftspeople, trade skills staff, trade skill staff from workshops across physics, the School of Art and Design and Engineering. Um, they were invaluable when advising on scaling up for production and also fabricating jigs and, and assembly methods. Um, with the campus shutdown, there were also many skilled people who were unable to do their normal jobs because they didn't have access to uh, their normal campus workshops. So being able to provide meaningful work for them to do um, by preparing materials, being on campus, using workshops, actually became a major, major positive of our project. Uh, once we had the materials and fabrication processes locked in, we then had to sustain production and distribute the shields to health services in need. Hi there. Um, so after the initial establishing period, which was really the fast and furious period, fabrication and distribution was largely smooth sailing. While there were some material hiccups, for example, we know far more about staplers than we ever needed to, the problem solving largely centered communications during the major fabrication distribution period. And they were mostly pretty easy problems. We used Office to create systems for communicating with volunteers and also communicating with health services to distribute to um, because there was a large volume of people we were speaking with. Um, and we also found with volunteers that we had to build in the lead time regarding getting them access to campus as, as the COVID situation evolved, the access protocols changed. Um, regarding distribution, we were able to distribute to three hospital networks across regional New South Wales and the ACT and to 23 local practices and health organizations. An example of the importance of open communication is the way that the identified need shifted throughout the project. So while we were initially distributing only to hospitals, around May we began to hear from a representative of smaller practices that work with 
that work with respiratory patients that they had chronically low PPE. And it was then that we started to shift to giving to smaller practices as well um, and started to create communication systems for reaching out to them and hearing back from them. Uh, in terms of our lessons learnt on pivoting and on trying to do a project like this with um, four main on the ground staff and then many, many volunteers, um, the most important things were that a specific need must be identified before planning can begin. We were really keen to get started and to help, but at the beginning it wasn't even clear what kind of PPE was needed or if it was needed in the ACT in New South Wales. Uh, open, frequent and well-organized communications, both internally and externally. This isn't just about uh, being good at expressing yourself or being open with your team. It's also about having the right platforms for communication for each specific need. So we had a WhatsApp for our core group, which allowed us to communicate with each other very quickly. Uh, whereas for larger groups, we had things like forms and mail merge for things like distribution. An open source culture allowed rapid information sharing and prototyping interna internationally. So both the, the masks and also the shields, they were both open source designs that we just adapted to the needs of local healthcare workers. And we absolutely wouldn't have been able to respond the way we did if it wasn't for those open source designs. Uh, similarly, a community network ensures the knowledge, skill and manpower that allows for rapid response. So it was only because we had other staff members who were highly skilled volunteering their time that we were able to get the amount of, um, the amount of products through so quickly. And also other members of the ACT community. And that's us, thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel and Sophia. It's really impressive that you could go from zero to 17,000 in such a short time. Um, we won't take questions straight away. Would the, the idea is we'll hear from our free pivots and then uh, go into questions at the end. We all also hello, have a Zoom chat. And so after the end of the free uh, presentations, we will have a look at the Zoom chat as well for questions. So I'm very happy to welcome Victoria uh, Wells, who is the co-founder and chair of Redeem. And Victoria, you're going to talk about uh, the pivot that Freedeem and yourself made. Um, so if I can go over to you, that would be wonderful. Thanks so much. I uh, just want to check everyone can hear me. We can hear you. Thank you awesome. very much. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, it's lovely to um, kick, off, kick off after um, Sophia and Rachel's presentation. Um, it's, I thought when you were referring to zero to 17,000, I was thinking more about the speed of life at which you were traveling um, in your adventures to pivot um, the maker space. Um, I think we've had similar journeys over the past couple of months. Um, there were a couple of things that I wanted to raise or just share um, in the experience that I had. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about how um, 3 dm came about. So, because that's relevant to context and quite crucial and critical to um, the pivoting success story that we had with Toyota. Um, and I can also share a little bit about what's happened after that. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of background, a bit of Toyota. Um, a bit of future work because um, happily there's um, some legs on some of the projects that we've um, developed um, in the course of COVID. Um, and then I guess I wanted to actually find out a little bit more about um, the attendees on this call and see if there's any anything that might be um, specifically relevant um, based on your subject matter expertise. And Okay, so background. Um, I was working in Toyota's legal department for a little over a year as a contract lawyer. Um, that gave me a really good understanding of the internal um, structure of the organization. As you can imagine, Toyota is a behemoth um, corporate entity. Um, in Australia these days, it no longer um, exists in the manufacturing space. It's very much a, um, a marketing company. Um, the relationship with dealerships mean that um, the head office aggregates and pushes um, 
marketing comms, um, coordinates um, those types of activities for the dealerships. Um, and um, being within this organization, there were certain things that I learned um, as a corporate lawyer. Um, I don't like hierarchy, personally. <laughs> it doesn't work for me. Um, but you learn the language of the organization that you're in. And our organization had specific language and specific decision-making um, structures. Um, for example, we have a culture of, um, a, a Toyota specific culture of um, uh, continuous learning. Um, if you have an issue or a problem, you go straight to the source. We even use a Japanese lingo for this. So going to the source means Genshi can get to. Um, if you wanted to get together with a couple of different stakeholders across various verticals within the organization, you might namawashi something, which sounds like I've left washing in the laundry. Um, there are all these like fun terms that you learn, but it really, um, at the end of the day, you become indoctrinated um, into the culture of the organization. And as part of that process, I sort of, I learned the, the language of how the organization thinks and makes decisions. Um, and um, happily, some of that language um, has been adopted wholesale within very large organizations, including tertiary hospitals. So you have this um, executive think tank methodology that's called the Toyota Way or TSSC for short. Um, and you have large organizations with a lot of layers and a lot of um, verticals within the organizations um, adopt this particular framework for making decisions and running critical decisions across various um, uh, sectors. So it was a very happy marriage that um, some of the language and the techniques for communicating um, uh, important information to different teams and executives um, within the hospitals was the same lingo and language that um, I had acquired over my time um, in the legal department. Um, so how did we pivot? Um, 3 d was born out of a recognition that um, Toyota has an incredible amount of um, value to give to the community in a time of crisis where manufacturing is involved, particularly local manufacturing, knowledge, expertise, contacts. Um, whilst they don't manufacture themselves, they have um, large established networks of Australian um, manufacturers. And when Toyota says, hey, those manufacturers usually respond with, they, they jump, they jump to move. Um, they want to be involved. So it was this recognition that there's a wonderful department within Toyota. It's called the product design department. It's a huge um, office space or um, really workshop in Port Melbourne. It has everything from, um, you know, huge full bed CNC lays um, uh, equipment that uh, you would usually find in heavy ind industry, um, basically laying around um, waiting for the next prototype for an aftermarket um, product. Um, so a lot of latent capacity in the machinery and a lot of latent capacity um, in terms of personnel operating that machinery and in the design team. So um, through my relationships um, within Toyota, I was able to um, somehow magically convinced the um, product design team head that we needed to do something and that we could very effectively um, complete a full design loop, um, producing a prototype, getting it out to clinicians, um, having an aggregate of clinicians across respiratory departments, ICU and other various critical departments, um, uh, procurement departments as well, um, to review designs and then turn around communications or recommendations or reviews, turn them around and um, complete modifications in a really quick cycle. So at one point we were picking up designs at six and seven in the morning, running them out to hospitals, running them out to um, individual procurement department heads, um, getting them back into the offices at around about nine or 10, getting the team looking at them, um, thinking about it and then producing something for the evening and then we just do it all over again. Um, some of the hours were crazy. Some of them were 20, 22, 23 hour days. Um, and they were pretty hectic. Um, and I think that one of the things that defined the experience for me was um, just a level of responsiveness um, from everyone um, that we came in contact with. And that was from uh, 
people within the design team that would go home and try and vacuum form plastic on their rice cooker because we're trying to figure out how to make a hyperbaric hood through to being able to get into contact with the National COVID Coordination Committee chair and sub chair and email them and tell them that you know we're having some issues with some supply chain and raw materials um, import into Australia or we wanted to know a little bit more about say the TGA um, process for expediting um, various classed um, devices um, and through to trying to identify whether there was going to be a immunity, a crown immunity right granted in respect of uh, use of third party intellectual property. We had um, engagement um, like I would not believe. Um, at one point, um, we were able to obtain some pretty senior um, uh, approvals just to ease the process of um, navigating interrupted supply chains. And I'm, I'm pretty sure, Sophia and Rachel, you encountered those experiences where you just you get to a dead end and you turn around and you're like, All right, what else? Let's just keep on pushing. Um, I, th I think that one of the things that um, characterized this experience for me um, and that I'll take um, further into my career is just keep pushing. <laughs> if you find a no, that's a soft no. <laughs> Look for the yes and keep on going until you get it. Um, so that's a little bit about what we did or how it came about and a little bit of what we did um, in terms of actual products and what we made. Um, uh, um, Rachel, I think it was you that identified, um, you had some challenges around um, identifying the, the designs, what was actually needed. Um, and we encountered that as well, um, where we couldn't get clarification of what was needed. We went straight to the source. We Genshi again get sued that one. And we went to the respiratory um, departments of the tertiary hospitals in Vic. We looped back in with um, Queensland and New South Wales and SA. Um, we found out what was up with the designs that were currently being supplied. We asked questions around, you know, modified Prusa. What does a Prusa design mean to you if you're on the floor and you're a nurse and you have no flat surfaces um, from which you can like assemble something, what do you need? Um, so we really, we went to brass tacks, went down to brass tacks and went back to the source and tried to identify what would be a good design in respect of each item of PPE um, and then just pick them off. Lost hanging fruit being face shields for us. So we produced um, a face shield with Toyota. Um, we um, produced a hyperbaric hood that works off several designs. That was a much more complicated project because it involved um, working very closely with the intellectual property of other parties. Um, and that's a fraught field. Um, we had a legal expert in IP um, on the team. We had a, a team of lawyers worldwide um, that we reached out to, to help us with um, uh, searches, so a freedom to operate searches. Um, we had an aggregate of um, clinicians reviewing the designs and the design modifications that we were making. Um, and a lot of the challenges that we found there were working with these existing frameworks for um, design protection and recognizing that they were going to be serious roadblocks for us in terms of getting designs out into hospitals. Um, and I don't know, as a lawyer, I found that extremely challenging. I like to think that um, I work in an industry that um, facilitates um, the protection and promotion of designs um, and, you know, intellectual property is the creation of a monopoly um, to protect designers um, and promote their interests. And in this specific occasion, um, it just caused us an immense amount of trouble. Um, yeah, really made me think about philosophically <laughs> about my role in all of this. Um, if you ever want to um, join me for a TED talk, I'm going to do a TED talk on how to violate international patent law in 11 days. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Um, what else did I want to cover? Um, because these didn't work for open source. Sorry? Yeah. Okay. Um, what have we covered? So we've covered um, how it came about, what we've done. Um, uh, let's hear from who we've we got on the call. 
I, I can see Ivan, I can see Sophia, I can see Rachel, I can see Neil, and I can see Christine. Um, we all... So you've got, the, a, you've got sorry? a mixture, Victoria. You've got um, some members of Materials Australia that are uh, uh -huh. obviously material scientists. You've got some members of the ANU fraternity. Uh -huh. You've got some members of RMIT that goes across social and engineering and, and business. Okay, so we've got a real mix. Um, I think the three lessons that I learned out of this experience are, yeah, um, a no is always a, a soft no. Keep on pushing until you get a yes. And if it really is a true no, then um, go back and redesign, um, go through the issue and come up with solutions. Um, the second thing that I've learned, law, intellectual property law, um, it's there to help, but it can sometimes um, cause more of a hindrance than a help. Um, and I mean, really, law is the, um, the formalization of social norms that we've all decided to accept. And I think we really need to look at how we, um, we use intellectual property, not merely as the sword or the shield um, that protects the individual interests of designers, but we need to look at how we um, deal with that in an emergency. Um, the third thing that I learned, um, the third thing that I learned, decision-making inertia of large organizations is real. Um, I've got a fun, weird analogy that I hope everyone can remember um, from my talk, if there's one thing that you take away. Um, cows, cows have a decision-making um, period of around about nine to 15 seconds. And this means that when you design a dairy, you create large gates rather than small ones. And you might put a gate with a long field of vision up to that gate. So a cow has a very long period of time to make the decision to go through the gate. So I would liken that to large organizations. You've got to work with big, um, big organizations, lots of people, um, very established ways and methods of thinking um, and you've got to work with that organization. You have to understand how it moves, um, how it makes decisions, how long it makes how long it takes to make decisions and what those stress factors are when it, um, decisions do need to be made. Um, and rather than pushing um, against that, know it and work with it and design your projects accordingly. Thank you very much, Victoria. There's a whole lot of parallels between our first two presentations around, <laughs> around law or lack of law and obviously around supply chain issues. But so I hope we'll we have a chance to dive into those uh, in about mm -hmm. 10 mm -hmm. minutes. But let's Just go now to our third presentator uh, and we move from a large organization to a small organization. So Neil, could you uh, talk to us about the pivot in a small innovative SME. Yes, thank you. Um, let me say that uh, the, the, the two presentations that we've seen this morning have been, or this afternoon, have set a high benchmark. And uh, I think uh, they brought out a lot of uh, relevant points regarding the uh, conditions that we face under this COVID-19 pandemic. I'll also preface what I have to say by saying that as an SME, uh, we've been in business uh, for 50 odd years now and, and um, the commercial aspects of doing business don't really change but certainly get impacted in different ways by these, these, these sorts of situations of recessions and pandemics and most of us uh, that have had long experience have, have not been exposed to this sort of pandemic in our work lives. So we are all learning and we are all adapting as we go. The world is currently in a state of confusion as to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it continues to exert an influence, not just over the way people go about their lives, but across all aspects of industry and commerce worldwide. The manufacturing industry has seen the effects of the pandemic become clear very quickly. And the myriad changes in the way things are being managed 
So how are manufacturing companies handling the crisis in both the short and the long term? Commercially, we need to identify a short-term fix to a long-term solution. With regard to pivoting, COVID-19 has produced a very significant change in the thinking uh, amongst the manufacturing community. Many companies faced with the existing loss of business due to the downsizing of the manufacturing industry in Australia and the fact that globalisation for many businesses has not left them in a financial condition to weather the significant storm produced by the onset of COVID-19. And as a commercial enterprise, we've been no different. Supply chains and materials technology is also an aspect of any manufacturing paradigm for many companies. Romar Engineering, which is my company, has been faced with the many difficult decisions that had to be made in order to survive. With a staff of 50 odd people, uh, it is a hung hungry organisation to feed on a weekly basis. Within the context, so confronted with the decisions related to the retention of staff or downsizing and the loss of work and orders intake is compounded with also having to deal with existing fixed costs. Within that context, it was necessary for ours and other businesses to pivot in order to survive. And, and I've heard the previous two presentations, which are premium examples of, of that. In my case, with my company, Romar Engineering, who is a diverse organization based in medical device manufacture and, and 3D printing. Um, uh, and uh, when I say the 3D printing, we've got the only uh, metal additive subtractive 3D printer in the Southern Hemisphere. And, and it is in a strategic relationship with uh, and a scientific relationship with the CSIRO that we have to uh, confront these conditions. The pivoting activities engaged in by the company were based on utilising the existing staff uh, and skill base within the business, the capacity and capability for the equipment and technologies that we had at our disposal in order to pivot. I can only say that the experience was, uh, we found very chaotic, uh, a very chaotic period of time with customers and government agencies consulting with us to have our business pivot in areas, particularly in PPE, that were in some cases very short term requirements. Large capital investments may have been necessary and in some cases very short term requirements. Large capital investment necessary and other cases outside the bounds of our capability. The decision making process involved ensuring that those products, processes or materials that were considered in a pivoting project were in fact analysed for their long-term impact on the business as well as the short-term positive cash flow component that the pivoting allowed or created. In the medical and biomedical space in which we function, the aspect of compliance to medical device was also a cognizant fact that underpinned decisions on whatever we made and whatever we pivoted to as they had to comply with the relevant TGA and medical device standards. Uh, it was pointed out to me very early in the piece that the molecular size of the coronavirus was extremely small and could pivot and could penetrate a lot of the filter materials that were being offered. Um, and as we can see, some of these products have been made, dispensed, and rejected as non-complying or ineffective in use. And it was a necessary step, particularly when it comes to acceptable levels of quality compliance required of a medical device regime. And it's even more relevant given the nature of this pandemic. Those projects that my company undertook related to the manufacture of components and assemblies uh, for the Victorian Grey Innovation Ventilator Project. 
uh, for which we made fundamentally several valves and silicone active diaphragms and oxygen flow monitoring devices, which was in our scope, within our capability and within our capacity, and also within our medical device certification. These components and parts were certified as fit for purpose and application by the local TGA. If we look at materials, the ability of companies to pivot is also relevant on the availability of the raw materials and the relevant materials. As to without these materials, companies cannot move into newer or expanded markets. It's also worth noting these materials must be certified as appropriate for the application for which they are destined. We can say that masks for COVID-19 can only be appropriately manufactured and certified as acceptable to deal with the virus with appropriate approvals. Supply chain for these materials can be very long with appropriate material shortage in a lot of cases and other supply limitations. My company during this COVID crisis has pivoted to manufacture uh, products that contain antibacterial capabilities and where possible include those materials that are able to be sterilized or kill against the kill the coronavirus. This process involves working closely with regulated bodies such as the TGA and the FDA, along with international experts. Uh, the test is the reaction time, and it's usually a long-term view rather than a short-term outcome, because some of these, uh, as we've heard, can be very time consuming and also cross the bounds of IP. And so you have to be very careful that in order to help, you're not disenfranchising the IP that is in, already in place. I read an article just recently uh, in a manufacturing magazine that sort of gave a, another, another example, which I'd like to, to uh, transcribe to you. Back in March, as the realities of COVID calamities were looming, Brewer Richard Adamson faced an unusual problem. It was a dilemma that in days of yore was considered a blessing. He had too much beer. Adamson is one of the founders of Young Henry's, a craft brewery based in Newtown, Sydney. Since he began in 2012, Young Henry's has muscled its way through a crowded, highly competitive field to become one of the premier independent brewers. And then it was faced with the prospect of drowning its own success, literally. When the government announced severe social distancing restrictions, including turning off the taps at pubs and clubs, Adams had had more than 8,000 kilograms or 4,000 litres of his lovely beer, sitting in a warehouse that he couldn't sell. Young Henry also has a ginger distillery and not long before the restrictions, it had distilled some bergamot essence to use in a fancy beer. He says we have heaps of this high alcohol bergamot essence and it smelled fantastic. As the virus was getting worse and worse, we thought we could turn some of it into hand sanitizer and put it behind the bar for customers, which we did. People were like, wow, you made this, can you make some more? It was then that we realized how much demand was out there. A decision to take was taken to turn the warehouse beer into hand sanitizer. Basically, we emptied the kid, kits into gin, uh, the kegs into, into the gin, gin still, and turned the beer into ethanol. He says ethanol, a type of alcohol, is active, is the active ingredient of hand sanitizer. That was the easy part. Everything from that point was a mad scramble because everything else they needed came from China, where supply lines and freights were dis disrupted. The vis viscous base in hand sanitizer is glycerol, which is sourced from animal fat and vegetable oil and was almost impossible to get. We spent hours on the phone and on the internet, Adamson said. We thought we had someone who could supply it then they dropped out. We eventually got a hundred litres from some guy on eBay, but we needed more. 
and it remains an ongoing issue. We eventually got 100 litres from a guy on eBay, but we needed more. But they then had to find dispensers because, again, most containers came from China. Each new batch had differently shaped bottles, so each one had to be filled manually. Greatly increasing the production process and time. This supply chain issue has been replicated across many industries during this pandemic. Young Henry's model has worked across other companies faced closure, facing closure during this time. And we've heard that in our previous uh, uh, presenters. One area that's been exposed as out of date in the current uh, is the current reliance on traditional supply chain methods. One outbreak of a restricted virus in, for example, China, even if contained, brings the rest of the world's manufacturing industry to a halt. This is a main area of concentration for those planning for the future generation of the manufacturing industry. A recent survey by, by the Australian Bureau of Statistics the question was asked, aside from relaxing government restrictions, what is needed for business to return to pre-COVID-19 trading conditions? 35% of respondents said increased or returned customer demand. 14% said increased cash flow. 13% said further government support and efforts. 11% said access to additional funding and 29% said nothing else that they could uh, put their finger on. So we have, we have uh, been going through a pandemic that has tested everybody's resolve, ingenuity and capabilities. And I think a lot of companies in Australia have done wonderfully well in comparison to some of our international uh, competition and and uh, suppliers. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Theo. And you introduced a couple of your ideas, although the the IP issue and the compliance issue uh, are coming through in yours as well. But we got the financial aspect in there as well, uh, which was really interesting to hear about. So I just uh, reiterate, wonderful speakers. Thank you so much, Victoria. Thank you so much, Rachel, Sophia. And Neil, uh, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. We can stay a bit longer if people can, um, or alternatively close depending on availability. But let's, let's go into the questions. Um, I've got uh, one question from Omid on my chat screen. And I assume this is to Rachel and Sophia because it said, um, how did you get the design of the masks and were they effective? Um. So we, we worked with both masks and face shields. Um, the face shields were University of Madison, Wisconsin, and they were available open source and quite early. We, we did a quick review of other face shield designs, but because, of, uh, because we don't have an actual factory floor of 3D printers, it was vastly more efficient economically and time-wise to work with things that could be laser cut or milled. And um, we narrowed it down to those designs and they were all open source. And perhaps okay. you can speak a bit to the masks, Rachel, because you were the genius behind the, the mask design. Uh, so with the masks, we, we, we were only ever intending these to be used as utility masks where there were no, there was no other alternative available to um, local organizations. Um, so we were initially, the intention with these was to go into pathology labs on campus where they just couldn't source masks. Um, so these were for splash protection. The design we ended up falling onto was uh, an open source one from the University of Florida, their College of Medicine, um, and it was using a sterilization wrap material, which has a bacterial filtration efficiency, um, but no particulate filtration um, as the material. Um, and it was essentially 
we were producing those for splash protection um, in occupational settings. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Rachel and Sophia. Um, now, I'm used to teams where you've got little hands up to show where people are asking a question, but I, I don't seem to have that on Zoom. So uh, either type your questions into the group chat or uh, just speak up and ask the questions directly. So, Anna. Hi, uh, my name is Anna uh, and uh, I'm working for ANSTA and the University of Sydney. And we also have a very similar projects on, um, on the cutter, but I'm interested in masks. When did you have the elective materials for it? So Sorry, when did we have the... Electrodes, the, the insides of the um, electric material used uh, for, uh, for um, N95 masks. We did not produce N95 masks. We were only producing utility masks, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Maybe we could take that to Victoria. Did you produce those sort of masks? No, we weren't producing masks. We were producing face shields, um, which is eye coverage, um, but also full face coverage as well on a different design, um, and a hyperbaric hood, which is a sealed hood with an oxygen intake under pressure. Thank you. Okay, so, so let's move on. Anybody else have a question? Well, I'm going to ask the devil. <laughs> okay, another one for that. Anna. Can I? Uh, I just want to. I'm so impressed uh, seeing ladies leading this um, uh, this uh, pandemic challenges on such a uh, such a scale. I wanted to uh, to know if you um, how you can see yourself and uh, and this project after the pandemic is over. Where? Mm -hmm what the strategy will be for you and your team. So if I could start with Victoria, then go on to uh, Sophia and Rachel. Um, well, I've, first of all, I never thought that I would become a med tech entrepreneur in like under 11 days. I never thought that that would happen, um, but it happened. <laughs> and I'm really happy that it did. Um, it's definitely changed my career. Um, and I'm in the process of understanding what that change is looking like. Um, currently, we have a clinical trial um, or we're in discussions for some clinical trials um, with several tertiary hospitals across Australia for the Hyperbaric Hood project. Um, I'm immensely proud um, that I was able to corral friends, family. My 71 year old mum was in a photo shoot for one of our products. Um, everyone was hands on deck from my closest friends to my um, colleagues on LinkedIn through to my long suffering boss. Um, everyone just knew that I was going to go at it and was like, okay, we'll get out of your way. Um, where do I see things going? Um, I would like to think that I learned a lot of lessons and so did my team out of this around how to move organizations very swiftly um, at a, in moments of crises. Um, my background in law, um, I originally started out in international arbitration, which, which puts you squarely in the sites of maritime law, and usually those are big incident issues. So um, I think the thing that I'm looking forward to next is understanding how um, remaining cool under pressure and understanding crisis management and decision making um, uh, in those in that context um, can marry with a sound understanding of fabrication and a passion for Australian manufacture. Um, I really do feel like we have excellent industry capability, um, immense talent, um, but we have an industry that's on its last legs in terms of commercial viability and it's incumbent upon us, our cohort, our generation, our academics, our people coming out of our universities to really emphasize that we can produce locally and to push. And that push is to encourage our communities to um, support Australian made. Our push is to encourage our institutions to back Australian um, design led 
um, projects. Um, and it not, it's not always about, um, or this is a personal belief, it's not always about looking for um, the incentives or the grants because those are quite hard to come by and there's a lot of competition there. Um, very much um, a grassroots um, uh, adoptee of um, tech and when I find something that I um, really like and I, um, I, I love the story behind it, I share it. Um, and I think that this is a time where we can get behind each other's projects and we can promote them and we can really make a difference. So, yeah. So, thanks, Victoria. And I hope today at least helps everybody know what everybody else is doing. It's really exciting. Um, now, we are getting close to the end. Can our four panellists stay for a few more minutes? Mm-hmm. In sure. that case, we'll keep going to 12.40. If people have to drop out, of course, we understand. But this conversation is just speeding up. I've got a number of things on the chat. And I also want to take that question to Rachel and Sophia. So basically, Anna asks, what's next? Um, so this was a really interesting showcase, I think, of what makerspaces can do. Um, our whole philosophy is really around um, open source, information sharing, community collaboration, um, distribu distributed manufacturing, a lot of digital technologies that we have access to here. So this, this, this sort of frenetic project that we all jumped into wholeheartedly really showcases what we can do as a community of, of makers and, and people and skilled people. Um, so it, it was really just amazing to see what we could do and how quickly and how quickly we could turn it around. Um, so we really want to sort of capitalize on that momentum and push to try and make this a bigger and better part of the university as well. Yeah. So Vidya, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think it's galvanized what we always fight for in the makerspace sector, which is that um, that being fundamentally interdisciplinary and open in terms of open source and open access makes it possible to do things very quickly and very efficiently and very well. Um, something I'm really excited for is actually getting started on our plastics recycling makerspace. And uh, maybe we can undo some of the damage we've done with all of these single use face shields. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was Let's one thing go, that we thought about too. It's <laughs> thinking about the sheer quantity of what you're making. In Australia, nobody. Okay, I might go to some of the, the questions on the chat then. So, Michael Fraser from uh, NATA asked, um, can he ask a question in relation to sourcing or uh, sourcing of testing for PPE? So, Michael, are you still with us? Yes, I'm. I'm still there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you? Okay. Can you um, find that I question? just. I was just wondering how the um, the groups went about getting some of the testing they needed done on the like, the, for instance, the face shields. There's an Australian standard for the testing of those to ensure. Um, the blood blood spattering or there's a sort of a zone that has to be protected by the shield. Um, I'm just wondering how you went about sourcing that or did the university do that testing for you? I'm just interested to know who, who was doing your testing, that product. Sorry, is that to me? Um, that's it's for everybody. So anyone, anyone would specific. like to, yeah, but it's really for face shields. Face shields, I know there's the Australian standard for the face shields. Um, Okay, so face shields are a class 1A, non-sterile. Yep. And so when it comes to obtaining your TGA certification, um, it is, you make, it's a self-declaration process. Um, so you test or you produce to a particular standard that can be ISO 9001, or don't call me on my ISO numbers, um, but there's various standards. Um, you don't always have to um, accord or meet those standards. You can um, certify to a, a, another different standard. Um, for our particular um, production um, uh, methodology, we were looking at in-house and then also external third-party testing. And of course, external third-party testing 
um, and manufacture and supply was with established plastics manufacturers in the medical field. So that was something that sort of came part and parcel with it. Right. Okay. Um, what, what about the um, group at ANU? So us being on the much smaller scale end of it um, and being a non-commercial outfit where we were donating shields, our testing was actually just directly with the clinicians in the hospitals. It I went through their infection control unit. They examined our prototypes. Um, we consulted with them on setting up our fabrication space on what they were comfortable with in terms of the controls we needed to put in place. Um, but we did not pursue TGA listing for any of our products. We were not yep. selling them. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Neil, so we, did you want to contribute? Oh, sorry, Sophia, you go first and then Neil. Yes, I want to hear from Neil too. Um, so we, we were very clear um, with the role of small scale research manufacturing that we, we were interim emergency um, and that we were hoping to remain interim emergency. Yeah. And that uh, people like um, Neil and Victoria would be helping the larger manufacturing sector retool. And yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, I can, I can uh, say that I've been involved with, uh, face masks since I made ResMed's first face mask back in 1989 and the materials that are necessary and the testing that's necessary for those materials are quite specific to things like cytotoxicity and, and uh, uh, skin irritation and the like and, and with, um, with the current COVID uh, 19 pandemic one of the issues with the the PPE masks was that um, in order for the mask to function you needed some filtered air coming through the, the basic filtering fabric or the body of the mask that particular material had to be N95 rated which Anna pointed out and we could not find any here in Australia. I found some in, in China that I had tested in, in Taiwan, and it was very particular about the molecular size of the mesh or the filtering material in order to comply and be effective within uh, the, the fight against the COVID-19 or the coronavirus itself. Yep. So, uh Asma, you had a question. Would you like to ask it verbally? Or would you like me to ask it for you? Well, I had a very similar question. She just wanted to know how you could test your products were effective in clinical settings. So how did you get clinical verification for your products? Uh, maybe if we start with Victoria, then move to... Rachel and Sophia, and then to Neil. Very similar to Sophia and Rachel, our design process started and ended with clinician um, engagement. So um, we would have shields um, or we would have particular modifications to hoods go out to a cohort of clinicians and we would just run those designs through um, through them um, and, and through various um, uh, clinical applications and environments. Um, and it was literally, it was just a, a cross check. You get your prototypes out, you get 11 or 12 comments back, three or four would be grouped into a particular area of the design. You would um, stress test those comments, you would produce different design variations, and then you would end and arrive at a design, well, you'd arrive at a design that met those needs. So. It was not so much about producing something that um, you might hope works for your clinicians. They're at the front line. You want to make sure that they're happy, very happy with the design that you're producing. Um, so it started and ended with them. It wasn't a test that happened at the end. Okay, thanks, Victoria. Rachel or Sophia, would you like to add to that? Uh, yeah, we had, I'd say it's very similar. Again, it went out to clinicians. We actually did 
do a few iterations throughout a fabrication process as well. So we started fabricating um, longer shields, then the clinician said that that was a problem, like um, looking down at it hitting their chest, so we shortened them. Um, we took on specific comments on board about the attachment points, um, the length of the elastic, and that was all incorporated um, essentially on the fly as we were fabricating, yeah. Yeah, so we, we consistently prototyped based on the feedback from medical workers, which was largely, largely coordinated by Rachel. Um, and I just add that um, we can believe it's effective or hope it's effective because the same people who were taking the face shields at the beginning are still asking for more. <laughs> uh, Neil, do you want to add to that question? Yeah, look, any, any uh, device, PPE included, needs a set of specifications. You need to test against those specifications. And whether it be cytotoxicity or irritation or effective filtration of uh, COVID-19 or uh, of coronavirus or other, um, you need to be able to specify what the limits of the test need to be and, and be able to test against those with the relevant authorities that are able to do that and are certified to do that. Secondly, this uh, pivoting we've done into um, uh, treating uh, materials with uh, antibacterial components, um, that needs to be clearly specified about what this material is designed to do and over what period. For instance, if we have a surface that's contaminated with co coronavirus, what can we do? What is the effective time to sanitize or sterilize that surface using the antibacterial content of the material? And so what we've done is we've adapted to material that's got a history of probably six years now, and we are testing the, the efficacy of the antibacterial um, uh, motion or, or effect. Um, after that period of time. Now we know we can, we can um, mix in different ratios that antibacterial component and it has a different effect in terms of the time it takes to kill off any viruses, you know, staphylococci or any of these others as well. So, you know, you need a set of scientific tests to validate what you're doing as fit for purpose against the spec that you've written. Okay, thanks. So we'll take one last question off our chat board, but this, this one has come up quite often on the chat and I'm not sure we have an answer, but at least we can uh, debate the point for a couple of minutes. So Rachel asks, how can we get quick access to raw materials required for manufacturing and not be reliant on international producers? Um, Neil, this is a passion of yours, so let's start there and then go uh, around the uh, speakers. Well, as I said in what, what I, the outcome of my uh, um, uh, component of speech was, you know, the area exposed uh, within this COVID pandemic was um, the supply chain exposure and, you know, we rely very much on China for our raw materials. Now, um, China is a extremely large co company with extremely high production rates of different components and materials. We need to look where else in the world that we can procure those same materials under the same uh, tested regimes and quality regimes that allow them to be substituted for uh, the materials that we have been up till now using from countries like China. And, you know, we've just had one, one uh, uh, component in this antibacterial plastics that we're, we're working with that uh, has been replaced with supply out of India. Because people are still looking for cost-effective supply, 
Um, and, you know, the cost of setting up some of these industries in Australia is very prohibitive for the volumes that are being produced or would be needed in Australia. Okay, Victoria, would you like to add to the supply question? Yeah, that's an easy answer. It's called invest in Australian manufacture, the end. Um, the, whole, the whole experience of COVID has revealed um, a significant vulnerability for Australia um, in respect of the production of PPE. We simply don't have raw materials. Um, it was such an exercise in identifying um, how to make 100% Australian made and work back every um, section of the supply chain to continue to um, uh, meet that requirement. And the inevitable conclusion that you come to is that we simply don't have raw materials nailed down. And yes, there is a significant investment in producing um, raw materials manufacture capacity in Australia, but it's something that we definitely need to turn our minds to. Thank you I, for that very passionate answer, which I happen to totally agree with. Um, let's go on to uh, Rachel and Sophia. I, I agree with Victoria, and I'd say that, um, like, it's political. The government has to invest in, um, in Australian manufacturing, and perhaps rather than investing in things which are completely unsustainable, like gas, to get us out of this economic crisis, we could invest in things that we need. Um, and I'd say that it's also the same question that you have um, in all sustainability endeavors, which is that, can you accept that things cost more than you're paying for them? Can I just add to that? I agree totally with what you're saying. But the issue is, in 50 years of experience with manufacturing industry, it's gone from 25% of GDP down to 6% uh, as, a, as a manufacturing, and a lot of that is in food. Right now, um, the debate going on, and, and, and I think uh, Victoria made the comment that we're in a transition period now. Do we, do we go back to being a manufacturing country, or do we forget it? because that is the level of um, viability that's left in manufacturing. And when we talk about price, one of the debates at the moment is that once this COVID uh, crisis is over, will people go back to selecting on price only? And so really we need as a nation to embrace what everybody said, Sophia and, and Victoria, that Manufacturing in Australia is relevant, it's needed, and we fund it and support it. I want to go to Rachel to see if she has a, something to add and then go back to Victoria for the last word on this one. Rachel, anything to add? I'm not sure I can add much more to that, actually. Um, but, yeah, I think the whole base there is covered. We really only ran into material shortages um, in limited areas, um, and it, it was just a case of, suppliers only having on hand what they would normally sell and COVID was an exceptional situation and there was no way there was enough materials around, around or as well as having that disrupted supply chain um, from overseas as well. Like it, it, it became a huge problem. Yeah. Okay. I, I, Victoria, did you want to have a final comment? You were... One little one. Um, I think that it's an oldie, but it's a goodie. Necessity is the mother of all invention. Um, all of the panelists um, have demonstrated innovation. Um, maker spaces are just wonderful places where you do get that um, cross vesting of knowledge and experience. Um, we need to have an attitudinal shift about Australian manufacture. I've had the benefit of working with incredible um, titans of FMCG, um, uh, uh, primary, pro uh, primary production, dairy, meat, um, uh, all sorts of stuff. Um, and there is, there's a space, there's a space for us um, all at the table of Australian manufacturer, but the attitudinal change is we must fund it and we must support it. And it's not just about 
an over-dependence and over-reliance on cheap things that can be made overseas. We really need to value our local capacity to make. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. And again, total agreement there. In <laughs> fact, I won't go into it because I've got my Materials Australia hat on, but uh, at <laughs> RMIT, we're running a process to examine exactly the issues of supply chains and local manufacturing. And I will send out to everybody invitations to the forums we'll, we'll be developing on that. Um, but I just want to use my uh, chairperson's prerogative to thank Rachel, Sophia, Victoria and Neil. They were wonderful presentations and more importantly, they were wonderful contributions uh, that you have made to our society through this pandemic. So thank you very much. Thanks. Um, coming from the talk, a lot of commonality, materials issues, uh, and interestingly, from a lawyer, uh, design issues and IP issues. Um, I think we need to learn a lot about what we can do there. We didn't have time to pursue that one deeply, but I think that's a really critical one. So good stories about the importance of communication, the importance of communication within the teams and the importance of communication with the commissions and the our users. So um, I think we've got a lot of insight from the four of you. So I thank you for that. Um, we will be producing from this, and Rujan, um, one of my postdoctoral fellows, has been sitting quietly listening, a piece on this for Materials Australia magazine. Um, obviously, we'll send it to all of our panellists for checking and, and commentary before we produce it. And so uh, to the audience, they will be able to see at least a summary of our discussion um, in an upcoming uh edition of Materials Australia. So I'm going to leave it there. We're a little bit over time, but it was a wonderful talk and wonderful discussion. So I thank you all very much and I'll close the meeting now. Thank you everyone. Thank you.